That two or three centuries used to be cute until it became two or three centuries. <laughs> it's nice to be with you today, and I think if you look around and if you've been a member of this organization for any time, you know that for the month of June, this is a pretty good turnout for the month of June, so thank you all for coming. Uh, to pay homage and tribute to a man that not only worried about the weather in June, but the 11 other months of the year, Herbert Spencer Clark. And every time he would introduce himself, he would always tell newcomers that there's an E on the end. Not C-L-R-K, it's C-L-A-R-K-E. Now, we all know Herb. Some of you have known him longer than uh, my wife and I. But uh, Herb and Barbara Clark were the first people that Terry and Mary Jane Ruggles met when we came to Philadelphia 39 years ago. And we were invited over to the news director's house, and here was this charming couple, and both had this, this great lilt in their voice, and, and they were very classy. Uh, but as I say, you have your own images of what Herb was all about. And here's some of the adjectives that I came up with. Warm, friendly, caring, avuncular, classy, and certainly a gentleman. That said, Herb liked to take everybody under his wing, and he had some big wings. And from my own personal experience, my wife and I had moved here, and we lived in one place for about six months and decided to buy a house. So we were going to move ourselves in a U-Haul. And I don't know if you've ever done that before, but we were just scared to death. So I rented this U-Haul and parked it in the driveway. Didn't say a thing to Herb Clark or anybody at the station, but the next morning, Herb Clark shows up with two other people from the station and moved us from an apartment into our home. And then Herb goes, uh, it was a little ranch house over in Cherry Hill, and he goes, Turry? Never call me Terry, it's always Turry. That was a South Carolina, or North Carolina. He said, uh, you know, these bushes around your house have to come down. I look around, I, I don't even have the boxes unpacked, and Herb's telling me that the bushes have to come down. So Mary Jane and I go to bed, and it's a ranch house, and we're there, and all of a sudden we wake up in the morning about 7 o'clock to chainsaws. <laughs> these chainsaws are going to, I said, Mary Jane, what the hell is that? We go out, and here's Herb Clark and a couple other guys from the station, and they've got these steel chainsaws, and they are cutting out every bush around our house. Turry, these things had to go. They, these things had to go. I'll, I'll, tell you how to, I'll tell you how to grow new ones. That's the kind of guy Herb Clark was to myself and so many other people that crossed his path. It was a very, very gracious family that he was part of. Now, Herb is a broadcast pioneer, you know that. He was part of this organization. He was president of this organization. He was also uh, one of the, uh, got the national award, uh, the, the local award that we give every year, the broadcaster of the year. But when you think about it, Herb Clark was literally a broadcast pioneer. We're talking about 80 some years and the things that he did and the things that he was involved in. Now he starts in Eden, North Carolina, and he goes to a, a small college there it stops that after two years and then goes to Bowling Green in Ohio. After that, in between the junior and senior year, he starts working at this local radio station down in North Carolina. And how many people in the room can raise their hand that started working at a little radio station someplace, huh? Yeah, a whole lot of us. Well, Herb did the same thing, goes back to Bowling Green. After Bowling Green, he gets yanked into the service. So he goes into the Navy, comes out, and then he ends up serving in two wars. Second World War and the Korean War. Gets out of the Korean War and immediately goes to Richmond where they take him on as a radio uh, announcer. Had that great voice. And it's the golden age of radio, but it's the infancy of television. So Herb becomes the news director at this television station and spends about three years in Richmond. And then he comes to Philadelphia. And of course, we all know what happened then. He came to Philadelphia and started uh, almost four decades of what became um, a, a legend here. Uh, certainly, he had a love affair with the Delaware Valley, and I think you'll have to admit that a lot of people in the Delaware Valley had a love affair with him. Personality, the lilt of his voice, the timber, the timber of it maybe, uh, and that smile, and you put it all together, and Herb Clark was comfortably contagious. You just felt good around Herb. And it seemed to me, from my observations in 39 years, that Herb Clark had his priorities in order. And Herb's first three priorities were family, family, and family. 
And he and Barb raised a good one, and through the magic of television, over the years, we got to see Herb and Barb's kids grow up on NBC 10. Ann and Barb and John, we got, uh, we got excuse me, Ann and Robert and John, we got to watch uh, how Barb and Herb raised them all. But that was his family, but he had this extended family. Remember I said the big wings? And anybody who worked at Channel 10 was part of his family. And what would happen is, most of the newsroom on any Saturday or Sunday afternoon would be in the Clark's Recreation Room. Barb was making chili in the kitchen, and Herb was getting potato chips and popcorn out, and there would be 40 people from the newsroom watching football at the, at the Clark House. And in the summertime, the Clarks would host a picnic, and there was Herb with his grill on, you know, his barbecue grill on, and people jumping in the swimming pool. Some of us called it uh, Camp College Avenue because of everything that happened uh, in, in Herb's house. Well, Herb made the news for almost four decades, but if you know Herb Clark, you know that he also made a difference. And I think that's really important in who we are and what we're all about. Some of you may know this and other things more than, than I, but here are some of the things that I've listed. I watched Herb do a grand job with the Philadelphia Flower Show. I would see him leave the station and go, Herb, where are you going? He said, well, I had to go over to Inglis House and, and read to some of the shut-ins over there. He'd do that a couple times a week. He led toy drives. He was very active in the Presbyterian Church out in Bryn Mawr. And he was also on the board of directors of Presbyterian Hospital here in Philadelphia. And I know for a fact, because I stole a lot of his speeches, uh, that he gave hundreds of speeches to people at no charge throughout the Delaware Valley. You know, if you go to any cemetery, there's a, a marker that says when you were born and a marker that says when you died. But the, maybe the most important thing at a headstone is that dash in the middle. And it's what you do with your dash in life that maybe is the most important. Well, Herb Clark just did a heck of a lot with his dash. And I think we all should remember that. We have several people that want to speak today, and we are under some pressure to get Glenn Hurricane Swartz back to uh, the station. But I just want to remind you, uh, Jerry, that, Herb is in, or that Glenn is in sales, not management. So he just, you know, he just sells this stuff. He doesn't manage it. So uh, let's start first with uh, Marion Lockett Egan. She uh, has a special tribute that uh, she'd like to start with. And I also want to mention, for those of you in the back of the room who haven't swung up this way, Barbara Clark is with us today. She's no longer in the area full time, but she has come up uh, to be here. She's uh, spending time with, uh, with her kids. What do you do with these things when you're trying to get rid of them? Well, I'm going to do what I usually do. Take it apart and fold it up. Thank you. I never worked with Herb Clark. I knew him only through broadcast pioneers, ad functions, and mutual friends until a few years ago. Our friendship actually developed when Herb found out that I was considering moving into Beaumont. From that time on, every monthly luncheon, Herb was my luncheon pal. Expounding on the advantages of moving into communal living as you age, and of course, selling Beaumont. I can still hear him say, Come on in while you can enjoy it. Don't wait until it's too late and you really need it. Well, I did move on in. And Herb and Barbara were there to greet me, befriend me, help me, launch me, see that I met all the right people. I had the perfect table to sit at at a function. And they even took care of my orchids when I would be away. I had the privilege of knowing Herb in the years after he took off his tie and his hair. It was quite a shock the first time I saw him bald. Eventually, he got to where he wouldn't just take it off occasionally, but it put it on the shelf and probably even forgot where it was. It was also difficult to schedule a dinner with the Clarks. Herb definitely preferred lunch. 
so he could stay in the apartment, watch the six o'clock news, and probably critique it. Well, I thought I was going to tell you some things that you didn't know about her, but you've just found out some of them. He did do two tours in the Navy. But in 1952, he began what he called his official broadcast career at WRVA Radio in Richmond, Virginia. A booth announcer, he was also working with the management and FTC to get a television license. When that happened and WRVA TV went on the air, Herb moved over to television. And while he was news director and putting together a news department, it was soon discovered that Herb was definitely on the air talent and a weatherman was born. It was also at WRVA that he met Barbara, wooed her and then married her, and finally persuaded her to leave her native Virginia when Atlantic Refining called Herb to come to Philadelphia in 1958 to be Atlantic's weatherman on WCAU TV. Barbara aborted her career, made the move, and raised the children, providing the home front to support the career that Herb had chosen. She made it possible for him to fulfill all the obligations of the, this career that he had. I would like today to salute the strength behind the star. Barbara, please stand. I feel privileged to have known Herb and Barbara in these sunset years, to have counted Herb as a true friend, and to have the pleasure of a continuing friendship with Barbara. And by the way, Terry, Barbara has not moved from Beaumont. She just visits the children. Thank you. Marianne, you're kidding me. That was a toupee? <laughs> wow. You think as a newsman I would have been more observant, wouldn't you? Well, we have several other people that we want to uh, hear from today, and, and we'll try to move this along fairly quickly. Uh, we do have some time considerations, so I'm going to go a little out of order here. Um, you know, Glenn Schwartz is the person who uh, anchors our weather now. He's the chief meteorologist, and in fact, he is a meteorologist. When Herb did the weather and I was there assisting him, we were just uh, announcers who were, read what the National Weather Service uh, said. Uh, but uh, Hurricane goes out on his own, and he knows what he's talking about because his background is so, uh, so broad and his experience is so great, and uh, he is the symbol now of, of weather at NBC10. But uh, Glenn Schwartz uh, is a local guy. He grew up here, I want to say the Northeast. Uh, Mount Airy, I beg your pardon. Well, I, if you live in the city, I guess you've got to divide those lines and be kind of snotty about it, Glenn. Uh, <laughs> but that said, uh, when Glenn was a little kid, he used to turn on that television black and white or when it turned to color, and uh, there was Herbert Spencer Clark with an E on the end. So let's hear from Glenn Schwartz. Uh, once a smart ass, always a smart ass. Uh, microphones that are uh, stationary. Yeah, I need an engineer. Um, I, I just have a couple of things that, you know, where Herb affected me, and, you know, in different ways than most other people. You know, I look at a day like today with the, you know, beautiful blue sky and the low humidity and you know, most people just love this kind of weather, and Herb loved this kind of weather, and he loved to predict this kind of weather because he could smile when he was saying it. 
I just find this boring. You know, I, I, just, I just want storms. Uh, when I was a kid, I learned about weather in the fifth grade in uh, Mount Airy and found it very interesting. And then I would go home and sit in front of the TV. And of course, these are days before remote control. And I would sit literally two feet from the TV so I could flip the channels and I could watch everybody. I had to watch Dr. Francis Davis on Channel 6 and Wally Kanan, the weatherman, on Channel 3. And, you know, those guys were meteorologists with science backgrounds who, again, helped inspire me into the science. Like, I want to be able to predict the weather one day. I'm still hoping to be able to do that. Uh, but I also would watch this guy, Herb Clark, on Channel 10. And what I got from him was the pure joy of doing what he did. I would watch him and I've never seen anybody who seemed to enjoy what he did as much as Herb Clark. And that was part of the conclusion that I reached is I want to be a meteorologist one day. I want to be able to be so happy doing what I do that I look like Herb Clark and smile like Herb Clark. And it, it just had an incredible effect on me. And we fast forward, you know, 40 years or so, and I got the opportunity to actually work with him. Not for a real long period of time, but the first time was the blizzard in 96. Uh, he had only been at the station a few months. And Bolaris was in Mexico on the beach vacationing. And Bill Henley was on vacation too. So it was just me and Herb the whole week. And I got to sit right next to him, broadcasting in the late afternoon. And like every once in a while, I would look over and it's like, I can't believe this. That that I'm actually working with the guy that helped inspire me. And it was such an incredible thrill. And I told him that, and he knew that, and that made him smile even more. Now, I got to interview him along with the other weather legends for a book that I wrote, the Philadelphia Area Weather Book, about 10 years ago. And he told me some stories, some of these stories about how he got started. But he also, one story he told me was about Hurricane Agnes and how he was involved in that and he had to go up to Wilkes-Barre and report on it and the effect that it had on him. And that he was going to be going to Harrisburg to report on the flooding there too. And they were gonna go in a helicopter and at the last minute he got called back because he had to write and anchor a special program on Agnes and the flooding. And that helicopter crashed, and the reporter and pilot died. And, you know, he obviously is very poignant in, in telling that story. But that was in 1972, and Herb continued to do the weather until I believe 1997. And I'm grateful for a lot of things in life. One of the things I'm grateful for is that Herb Clark was around another 25 years to report the weather on Channel 10 and how many people that he influenced as a result. And now I have to get to work and report on this boring weather. Herb, by the way, won a, uh, an award for that, uh, a national award for his reporting on Hurricane Agnes. And just as a side note, uh, her, her, did I say Herb? I did Hurricane Herb. Herb won a national award. But Hurricane left me this note here that says, weather books on sale in the lobby, 1795. 
So uh, on your way out, if you want to uh, grab that. Alan Tripp is a longtime board member, and he is also a, a, a lifetime board member emeritus, uh, and he has some comments he'd like to share and some stories about Herb, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Herb Clark was not the man that you saw. He had many different layers and many different personalities. What you saw in the air was the lovely, gracious, kind Herb Clark. But I knew him very well because I ran an ad agency and he did commercials and things for me and he played golf with me. Well, he didn't really play golf. What he did is he went out there and tore up the turf. He, you know, Terry told you how he cut up the bushes. But what he did do were some wonderful things that I just want to quickly tell you about. Number one, the man had an incredible memory. He didn't ever forget anything. And listen, Barbara had something to complain about. He never forgot anything. He even wrote a book. This is the book he wrote. Did anybody know about this? It is called The Times That Made Me, Me. I gave him the title. I wrote the introduction. And then I said, how are you going to get all this material? He put 60 years of detail in here, every Navy trip. He, he knew each one of the people he shot. He was an amazing man in that respect. He not only remembered all that, but he told me stories about what they discussed with John Facenda. Any old CAU was around here? After the news, Facenda wouldn't let the crew go home. He made them go out to dinner with them, and they'd sit there and tell stories. 20 years later, Herb Clark repeated the stories to me. So here's a man with a remarkable acumen. He had a second aspect that you may not know about. Marion Lockett Egan hinted at it when she said how he would sell her on Beaumont while he was sitting here. I was in a worse position. I drove him to the broadcast pioneers from Beaumont because he said, you drive better than I do, you drive. So I was driving and he'd say, you know, you really ought to move to Beaumont. I said, why don't we talk about broadcasting? He'd say, no, it's great, the food's terrific. This went on for two years and I moved. It was <laughs> It was a lot easier. Well, it was a good move. <laughs> the, the other thing about Herb that you may or may not know, he really was not a weatherman. We know he wasn't a meteorologist, but he wasn't even a weatherman. He didn't know a lot about the weather, but he had a gut instinct about it. And he turned out to be just about as accurate as most of the people that knew a lot more. <laughs> but he, I asked him one day, I said, Herb, you know, what, what is it that you're doing on the air there? He said, I'm being nice to people. Isn't that interesting? He really, in telling them the weather, he tried to do it in such a way that he wouldn't hurt anybody's feelings. Glenn Schwartz has left. I can't say anything nasty about him, but I will say this much. He loves the hurricanes. He loves the bad weather. Not Herb. If there was a tornado, he'd say, there may be some bad things coming. Be careful. Finally, I asked Herb, if you didn't study it and if you don't know anything about it really, how did you learn to be a weatherman? How did you learn to do this job? He said, I was in the Navy. Any sailors or ex-Navy people here? Dick, I know you are. I said, how did you learn? He said, they, they taught me in the Navy how to be a weatherman. Well, what, what did they teach you to be a weatherman? He said, they taught me this. <laughs> Thank you. That was very good. You know, when uh, you think about Ed Cunningham, he is kind of the iconic symbol of WHYY and Channel 12, and nobody knows how to get money out of people. Sit down, Ed. We, we have, yeah, can't leave the room here. Nobody knows how to get a dollar out of people better than Ed Cunningham. Uh, but he also knows the difference between Schubert and uh, Stradivarius and those kinds of things. He's a, he's a cultured man. Uh, he's a Temple grad. And while we know him from WHYY and Channel 12, uh, he worked at Channel 10. So I'll let Ed pick up the story from there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Terry, that is uh, right. This goes back many years to the day when I was a callow youth. And it was a long time ago, around the time that you were a callow youth and Jerry Klein. And I think it's really emblematic of what Herb Clark was all about. I was a copy boy. I, don't, I, I think in later years they started calling copy boys desk assistants. I don't know if they still have them today, the newsrooms, perhaps they do. But in those days it was a little less uh, dignified sounding. I was a copy boy and that's the way I helped work my way through college. Uh, I would get the wire service copy to all the reporters and so forth, do all the grunt work, that sort of thing. Very much the opening rung, the bottom rung of the ladder of getting involved in broadcasting. And again, it's very important about what Herb Clark was all about. He didn't care if you were the anchor or the chief reporter or a visiting dignitary or a college kid working his way through. He was friendly to you and he loved to talk to you, and he always talked to me, wanted to know what was going on in college, talking about this and that. That's the way Herb was. Unfortunately, it was uh, a quality of Herb's that, at least on one occasion that I can remember, got him into a little bit of trouble anyway. It was a Saturday night. And we had done all of the getting together of the news. The news was on. So at that point, all of us could sit down and relax and actually watch the news. We had to stay there until the news was over. I don't know if they still do it that way these days, but back then, and, and I, by the way, I should say, on a Saturday night, it was John Facenda as the anchor, Herb was doing the weather, Tom Brookshire doing the sports, uh, Donald Barnhouse would be in to do his commentary. They had the A-team every Saturday night, no question about that. So anyway, the news was on, and usually I guess Herb would go on around 20 after 11 to do his weather forecast, and of course John would introduce him. Something must have gone wrong with the timing that night because as was Herb's uh, practice, as the news was on before it was his time, he would hang around in the newsroom with us, copy boys and all, chatting and watching the news. And so we were sitting there watching the news and John was going on reporting about this and that. And then finally he said, I'm gonna to try to do my John Facenda imitation, now let's go over to the weather board and Herb, find out what's happening on the weekend weather. How, how is that? That's not, not so good, I guess. Well, of course, Herb was standing next to me in the newsroom watching this on television as it happened. And I looked at this and I saw John Facenda introduce Herb. And I looked up and I saw Herb standing next to me in the newsroom. And in that incisive way that I have of sizing up the situation and determining what to do, in times of crisis, I went, huh? <laughs> and I looked at the screen, and I give you my word of honor, I can remember it to this day, it was about 1968. John made the call, and they cut to a shot of the weather board with nobody there. <laughs> I looked back down, I looked up to see what was going on with Herb. I don't know how to describe this scene. It's kind of like you ever watch a cartoon, and there's a cartoon character, and he's running away from maybe somebody who's chasing him or whatever the situation is. And as he's running away, all the papers go flying around in the air. I'm here to tell you right now, that can actually happen in real life. Because it did that night. I looked up, the papers in the newsroom were flying around all over the place. The door to the newsroom was swinging open and shut. And Herb had sprinted at about, I guess, 30 miles an hour into the studio to do the weather. A little bit out of breath and very much embarrassed. And finally when he was over and he threw it back to John, he said, John, back to you. They cut back to the anchor desk and there was nobody there. <laughs> <laughs> and after about two seconds, John rose up from behind the desk and he said, just me here, I'm just trying to get back at you. I can honestly say the first time I can ever remember John Facenda attempting humor. It was actually pretty good. But anyway, I tell you that story. It's a dear memory of mine because it speaks to what Herb Clark was like. He didn't hang out with all the big timers. He hung out with us all because that's the kind of human being he was. And on a maybe a, a little bit more serious note, I guess, finally when it came time for me to to leave as copy boy and to go on to my real full-time career 
as I began to get into broadcasting. I said so long to everybody in the newsroom. They said, all right, good luck, Ed. Good, good, good luck to you. And I went up to Herb, and I said, Herb, I'm leaving. I'm taking a job wherever it was I took it. And Herb looked at me, and he said, I just want you to know this, Ed. Wherever you go, wherever your career takes you, wherever city you may be in in your career, always remember that you've got a friend back here at WCAU. That friend is me. I tell you, I've taken that memory with me wherever I've been ever since that time. It still wells me up a little bit when I think about it. About 20 years after that, uh, after Herb had retired from WCAU, he came over to WHYY to do a couple pledge drives with us, and I made sure that one night as he was leaving after his shift with us, that I came over and I told him what that had meant to me for all those years. It did mean a lot to me then, it means a lot to me now. So, Jerry, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to reminisce a little bit about the great Herb Clark. Thanks, Ed. And maybe it's as clear as the, and the nose on my face, or maybe you don't see it, but we just saw a perfect example of the difference between public broadcasting and a um, make-profit uh, television like NBC10. Very seldom will you find a person use the term callow youth two times in one <laughs> sentence. Now, Ed, I have a college degree. I've been around a while. I don't know what the heck you're talking about. Does, it, does that mean the kid grew up on Callow Hill? And also, there's a twixt on my machine here that said uh, NFL Films called and, and stay at Channel 12. <laughs> Bill Wright Sr. has uh, been a fixture in the tri-state area for a long, long time, those old radio days. Bill is down here. So we're, we're com coming to you now, my friend. Don't, don't get up and just let me pass this across, see if I've got enough hose for you. I feel like Monty, Monty Hall in some kind of quiz show here. Thank you so much. I, I, uh, I wore the hat so you'd all recognize me. Anyway, I, I wore the hat because it was given to me by my son Kevin for Father's Day, and I swore that I was going to wear it all week, even in bed. It's a, it's a great hat. Uh, my name is Bill Wright Sr., and I came to Philadelphia the same year that Herb Clark and Vince Leonard came to town. That is a few minutes ago. And as I plied my trade with rock and roll at Wibbage, Herb was doing his at the, at the uh, Channel 10, and Vince, of course, was oh, pre-big time, but soon to be big time on Channel 3. Mike Grant was program director of WCAU, and Mike was a fellow parishioner of mine and a, and a friend. And Mike said, how about we get a poker game together? And I said, great idea. I love the thought of taking somebody else's box on payday. So he said, I'll, I'll get the other participants. One of the other participants was a guy named Herb Clark. And I had seen him on television, and I was pleased to welcome him. We had the event in my home on Sinclair Drive in Radnor. Now, Herb will tell you that I cheated. <laughs> and that always got a laugh, Herb. I couldn't have cheated because I never won. But those were some very memorable days. And uh, socially, occasionally, Herb and dear Barbara, who I'm so pleased to see is here today, uh, would get together. And, and I remember events like the Sugar Town, uh, not the Sugar Town, but the Devon Horse Show and, and other events like that. I do know this, and it's been said more than once here today. Besides being an upstanding person, Herb Clark, I knew to be a gentle man. We miss you, Herb. All right. Uh, 
show of hands, raise your hand if you have a national, a national Emmy. <laughs> One hand in the room, it belongs to Dick Kearney. Dick, come on up. Dick Kearney won an Emmy for his coverage of the Masters. And he worked at Channel 10 for a whole lot of years. And, and he knew Herb when they were in commercials. And, and I mean in between segments. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, Emmy Award winning cameraman, Dick Kearney. Well, besides being a, a co-worker with Herb, I was also a personal friend of Herb's, and I miss him very much. I have to tell you a story about Herb. He came in one day to do the news, and we asked him, Herb, uh, we understand you just bought a house over in College Avenue. He, he said, yes. And we said, well, uh, do you like it? And he says, yes, it's very nice. He said, but I have a problem. We said, what's that? He said, the house needs so much. It has to be painted inside the bedrooms and, and what have you. So I told the rest of the crew about it. The next day, after the news, the whole crew goes with Herb up to his house and painted until dawn. And of course, Herb supplied all the free beer. <laughs> but uh, that uh, shows you how well Herb was liked by everybody. And I'll never forget him. So one more quick story. Herb used to come in to do the, the weather in the Atlantic uniform. And I remember we'd say to him, Herb, would you go check my oil? <laughs> Thank you all. Orion Reed has been off the air for 10 years? No, 15. 15. That said, you can still be walking down the street with the Orion and people go, hey, Orion Reed. Uh, she worked Channel 3 and Channel 10 for a lot of years, and of course, she knew her very well also. They had a special bond, and Orion would like to share some of her thoughts. I want you to know, Barbara, that I thought from the moment I met your husband, I went, for, as, as you said, Terry, from Channel 3 to Channel 10, and I was a little bit anxious um, because you wonder, well, first of all, will anybody like me when I get there? Uh, will they be resentful or whatever? But one of the first people that I met was her whose desk was near mine, and he said, so I've been watching you for a long time, and that made me feel pretty good because I had been watching him for a long time too as well. And I'd like to think that there was a bond because he was so genteel. He was a gracious, genteel kind of man and that fit right well with um, my personality too as well. And we were both Southerners, so we had something immediately in common. He was supportive. Um, Herb would talk about uh, his loves, the loves of his life, and we were both um, church members. And he would talk about Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church and all the things that, that he was doing there. Herb and I did, I remember I had a segment on growing your own garden and saving money by doing that. And as you all know, Herb had a garden. And one time it was at the station, but another time it was at your house. And I was there shooting it too as well. And Herb said, you know, I think you have a bit of a green thumb. You know, you should join one of the groups in, in the Horticultural Society. So it was Herb Clark that got me to join the Indoor Light Gardening Society as part one of the groups. And I think I had, I bought all of these lights, spent a fortune for those things, and grew all kinds of vegetables and would bring in a tomato about this big to Herb and say, well, try this. This was, this was all done under lights. And he said, well, it's, it looks like it's pretty good, too. So he was just such a thoughtful man. Um, as many of you know, when uh, in 1988, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And I got involved with the Alzheimer's Association. 
and started the first memory walk in Philadelphia. And your sweet husband, I could always depend on when I was going around the station to ask for sponsors, Herb Clark would be the one to write the largest check as a sponsor. So I am just so grateful that I even got a chance to even know him. Uh, as I said, he sat right behind me and he'd give me some tips on things that I should do. And I miss that even though I'm not on the air. I miss his gentle soul and I just think it was such a pleasure and we are all better for having known Herb Clark. Thank you. If you're watching your watch, we're down to our last three speakers here, and they all have something important to say and share with us. Um, Big Al Meltzer and I have been friends for a long, long time, and Big Al and Herb and I used to have the best deal in the world because I would fill in for Larry Kane in the summertime, and of course, Al had to stay to do the sports, and Herb had to stay to do the weather. But as soon as 6 o'clock was over, we would get in someone's car and go down to the vet at that time and go up to the sports ring up there where all the sportscasters were, and it was great because you could sit there and have dinner, have a beer, and then you go out and watch the first three innings eating these big scoops of ice cream that they sent for you. <laughs> it, was, it was a nice way to live back then. But Al and Herb and the Baldinis and the Ruggleses used to get together on all the holidays because we all had to work, so we'd all go out between shows. Uh, and right now, Al has some memories that he'd like to share about Herb Clark. Okay, everybody. <laughs> you got to mention another fact. When the meal was finished at the stadium, there was no bill, meaning everything was on the house. And they just loved to go watch the Phillies play. Baseball was incidental. And Herb and I spent a lot of time in the press box during the baseball season, just kind of talking. And what we talked about usually was, see, in about a week now, I'm going to be 85. So I was really kind of a senior member when I got to Channel 10. I had worked in the area since 64, and I went to 10 and 80. So here's what happens. You go and you get into conversations and you get to learn about each person that you're working with. And of course, if you worked in the town a long time, you knew obviously, like everyone else, that Herb Clark was not only a gentle man, but he was one of the nicest men I have ever met. Let me tell you something. I don't know who said it, but I, I keep it forever. They said to me, look, someday you're going to retire, and someday you're going to find out that you have maybe a handful of very close friends. I believe it, because that's exactly what happened to me. We would sit and have to pay in the cafeteria at Channel 10 and talk about everything. We came up together in the business. I started uh, legally in 55. So we talk about the early days. We talk about uh, anything where we shared. Now, he was Navy and I was Air Force. And one day I said to him, I said, you, you know, you and I are both in the prediction business. I predict ball games, and you sometimes predict the weather. <laughs> I added to that with, look, Herb, you're a good guy, but in all fairness, if I was as close to being as accurate as you, I'd have been out of a job 20 years ago. <laughs> but we liked each other, and we'd sit and we'd talk and not just about the business, because we were all in the business, but I found him to be one of those people who, at the end of the trail, 
was going to be one of my very, very, very close friends. If you could love another man, I love the man. And to his lovely wife, forever and ever, congratulations. You really went with the right guy. Now, the whole thing about television is that everyone knows who you are. At least you hope they know who you are. And if you've been in town long enough, you know, be nice, you know, hey, how you doing? Well, I just give you one small story, and it happened on City Avenue, and there's a sandwich place there. Is it still there? Right across from the mall. Well, whatever. Yeah, we went, and, you know, everybody had sooner or later a couple of blocks up from Channel 10. So I was feeling pretty good, and I come out, and I'm walking around, and as I look, the guy says to me, who, by the way, is one of the street people, he was sitting down outside to see what he could collect was coming from inside. I walk out, I turn around, and he says, how you doing, Herb Clark? <laughs> he knew more people than I knew. <laughs> but when you talk about her, I can only talk about Herb in the sense that he liked everybody. He liked everybody, and you can't do that too often. But I found out also that a lot of what happened to me after I moved to Channel 10 was directly connected with Herb Clark. We would talk about anything, not just the weather or sports. We'd talk about the world. We'd talk about raising kids. We'd talk about anything because we shared that common bond. We were guys who got in the business and made it our career. And if Herb left anything behind, he left something that very few of us in this business can say. I never ran into a person that didn't like Herb Clark. And we loved him, and we thank you very much. Our next to the last speaker is someone that really doesn't need an introduction because he is one of those iconic figures, even though he hasn't been involved with the, the current Philadelphia Eagles in quite some time in the capacity of which he once had. Uh, but Jimmy Murray is, is kind of like Santa Claus without hair in my mind. Uh, he's just, I, I, you know, he will find a pony in a pile of horse shit. And he, he, just, he just knows how to always put a good spin on things. So Jim, please come on up. I took the hair off in honor of Herb. Uh, <clears throat> I guess that was a good intro. Uh, the title of my book when it comes out, Mr. Tripp, is gonna be Life's an Audible. And this is an audible for me because I didn't know I'd have this privilege and I, I don't say that lightly. Um, Herb Clark, Channel 10, you know, life's a team sport. And, and I was thinking when Terry came over, and Terry, you know, he reminded me of today, and this is the highest praise I can give you, Dick Vermeil. I'll take it. They are. <laughs> and I remember in interviewing Dick Vermeil, it fits into Herb a little bit, because Herb and I used to talk about the South. I started my career at, at baseball in the South. And uh, I said to Dick Vermeil, he said, why should I come to Philadelphia? I said, what the heck's that mean? He said, well, the fans. I said, well, forget I'm in charge of blame and the general manager. I'm a fan. I said, I'm going to tell you two things, and this fits into Herb's story. I said, number one, when you check us out and you look at the films, you'll be excited getting a standing ovation if you win the toss. That's how bad we are. <laughs> but the point... The, the point that comes back to this podium and this time and the honor of sharing the broadcast pioneers is the Philly part. 
I said, let me tell you about Philadelphia. If you come to Philadelphia and you just be yourself and you level with people, not only will they embrace you, you will move here. You will stay here, whether it's Richmond or North Carolina or his bride from Virginia, Barbara. And you know what? You'll be part of Philadelphia. And you can come from upstate New York or you can come from all the places that people in this room have journeyed. And that to me is the best of Philadelphia. Everything started here. Everything started here. And I guess I'll end with the story my buddy Mike Minter told me about. It's a Northeast Philly guy. And I say Northeast Philly too, not Mount Airy. On, <laughs> goodbye, Glenn. And uh, he became a deacon down in Carolina. And out of the mouths of babes comes the real good stories. And uh, he looked down at his grandson and he says, uh, I have to give my first homily tomorrow. What should I talk about? And I was thinking that when you came over and blitzed me. And he looked up in the way kids talk and he said, Papa, you should talk about two minutes. So <laughs> you got one of the best guys coming up here. And I'll end with two little Catholic things like my buddy there, Mr. Wright. Uh, there's a great quote from St. Francis de Sales that says, nothing is so strong as gentleness. And that word's been used rightly by people here, and there's nothing so gentle as real strength. And whether he was moving you or cutting your bushes down, whether he was there for everybody, he was the definition of gentleness. And I'll end with something I read recently in a little, remember in the old days of pay phones? We do a show called Remember When over there. My buddy Stevie Wonder and Jackie. And uh, <laughs> this, this stuff is kind of, Steve says, Mark, Look, it's a show about nothing. We're not talking about sports. We're not going to talk about politics. We're just going to talk about the old days. And that's what's great about what's happening right here. And I, I've only been there seven years. We get all the drunks, all the guys going home. <clears throat> One nun said to me, Jimmy, you put me to sleep every Saturday night. I said, is that a compliment, sister? But anyway. <laughs> I'd like to give everybody an assignment, just like I was respectfully and honored that... Terry came over and said, hey, Mark, do you want to say a few words? And this lady is battling pancreatic cancer. But she wrote something that I have just shared with anybody at any podium that I, in the last two years. And she said, I never realized that the word silent and the word listen have the same letters. So here we are, people who deal in communications and silent. And maybe sometime tonight, when you turn off the TV, when you're going home and you're enjoying the nice day, you just stay silent for about a minute and listen to your heart and think of your favorite Herb Clark stories. Thanks. Is there any doubt in your mind that if Jimmy Murray sold Amway soap, he could be a multimillionaire right now? <laughs> you might not be richer, Jim, but you might have more money, so. Uh, our last speaker, uh, I sat next to for 34 years at NBC10. Bill Baldini has been my friend and my mentor and my buddy for uh, over three decades. But he was a friend and a mentor and a buddy uh, to Herb Clark for even longer than that. And, uh, a guy by the name of Eric Ober and Bill and Herb and I would uh, play racquetball every Tuesday night. And we'd, we saw the real side of Herb when he would get upset and say words like darn and shucks and fudge. <laughs> but uh, Bill and Herb uh, were inseparable a, a lot of times in a lot of ways. And so our final speaker today before we adjourn for this June session of Broadcast Pioneers is my friend Bill Baldini. Here's the good news, I'm going to be short and sweet. When I decided I was going to come here today a little early, my wife had several friends over the house and they said, where are you going in that suit? And I said I was coming here and it was a tribute to Herb Clark. And this one woman looked at me and she said, didn't he get his start as a milkman? I said, no, why do you say he started out as a milkman? She said, I remember he had that uniform on. When he... 
I said, no, that was Atlantic Richfield. <laughs> uh, Herb Clark was a lot of things, and one of the things that uh, comes to mind when people describe him is loyalty. He was loyal to his family, he was loyal to his church, he was loyal to his country, and he certainly was loyal to his friends. And I was one of the many beneficiaries of that loyalty. This man would do just about anything in the world to make your life a little better. And he did that for me many, many, many times. And he even invited me on a trip to the Caribbean with his friend Dean Birch who owned this 56-foot yacht. And there were six of us and we, we were the crew. And we would float around to any island we wanted to go to. But during the day, we would sit in that cockpit, and Herb did love his cocktails. And he had a few uh, that one day, and we were getting off on this island, and he was insistent about me being very careful about leaving the yacht and getting onto the dock. I said, okay, Herb, and I, I kind of gingerly jumped off. And then he went like this, watch this, Bill, and he missed. <laughs> he went. He went down underwater, his wig came flying up, was floating, <laughs> and I said, what the hell was that? And he said, I just flipped my wig. <laughs> I said, I'll never forget this. He says, don't tell anybody about this. So I did keep it kind of uh, to myself for a long time. But he was truly a gentleman, as everybody said, and Barbara, you know, our days and months and years together were just delightful. I enjoyed coming to your home. I enjoyed going down to Virginia and that home. And my family to this day remembers how kind and generous you and Herb were about your pool. The Clarks used to tell us I had two children and they would say, come over anytime. And when they would go on vacation, Herb would say, here's where I, here's where I hide the key. Take the key, use the bathroom, use the refrigerator, change in there, come anytime. The pool is yours. Now imagine how, how generous a gift that was, especially when you're dealing with two children. And I remember your children growing up, and they were the pride of his life. I, what makes me feel old is that your oldest son is 55. I remember when he was a little kid. It, 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 something like that just scares me to death. But I'm going to end this by saying something that means something to me. I went to a high school called St. Thomas More. Thomas Moore was known as the man for all seasons. When I think of Herb Clark, that's exactly what I think. He truly was a man for all seasons. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is 2.30. The time has flown by. I hope you've enjoyed reminiscing as much as we have. This concludes the a program for today. I'm reminded that those of us who have spoken today about Herb, they'd like to get a picture uh, with us and Barbara as soon as uh, this is concluded.